We'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We're very glad that you're with us and we are about to start a brand new study of the book of Exodus tonight. So I want to invite you to be turning with me to Exodus chapter 1. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad to have you with us. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns about class, if there's anything that we can do to help or encourage you in some way, if there's anything that we need to be praying about as a group or me individually, uh, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can call or text us at 608-224-0274. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can visit the website at fourlakeschurch.org and find the contact information there. And we'll put that information on the screen in just a moment, and that'll stay there throughout our study tonight. We've updated the contact information since our last series on Genesis. And then you can also find us on social media by searching for Four Lakes Church. We're out there in several places. And then we also, of course, want to invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications to be reminded whenever we go live or add something to that channel. Uh, just a few quick notes from a technical standpoint. Some of you may be curious about this, but we've been using the microphone that's built into the webcam for several months now. We've been using the a webcam for maybe six months or so and a few months back the old microphone that's really superior to this one started acting up a little bit but I don't suppose it's better if it's acting up so we just thought it'd be easier to use the microphone that's built into the webcam so maybe not the same quality that we were used to six months or so ago uh, but this is the way it is in the webcam now so hopefully it's okay let me know and we'd be glad to check on it if you're having a hard time hearing it and then the other thing is, you might have noticed that we have a different light over here in the background. Uh, I brought in the kerosene lantern off of our back patio for this series of lessons on Exodus. Several months ago, I noticed that the camera would sometimes lock onto the background, the sheet that's hanging behind me, instead of locking onto my face for getting the exposure right. And so that would make my face just shine like the sun, uh, more than normal, I suppose. And then the background would be all washed out. And instead of a black sheet, it'd be this uh, kind of medium gray wrinkled mess back there. And it would jump back and forth between those. So we saw a World Video Bible School video a few months back with a light bulb hanging over to the side over the guy's shoulder. So I thought we'd try it a little bit. And when we did, it really helped the exposure issue. So uh, the camera can see that there's some kind of light there, and it decides this is what I want to uh, be focused on in terms of the exposure. So I don't know. I just thought you may be curious about the light that's been over my shoulder for a while and now the lantern. And uh, I just hope I don't pass out from the fumes down here. Hope nothing burst into flames down here in the lower level of my home. But I already have a new light for our next study after Exodus, so I'm already ready for that one, so we can switch to that one if we need to, or if, uh, if something does, in fact, burst into flames down here. But as I said, we are starting a brand new study of the book of Exodus. So we looked at Exodus back in 2007. Uh, that was somewhere in the middle of our 22-year-long verse-by-verse study of the Bible. And so it's been a little while since we studied this book as a congregation, and I think it makes sense to study it now since we just wrapped up our study of Genesis. And we thought we may just continue on our study in chronological and canonical order to save us some time with all of the background material. Don't need to rehash that. Uh, the background to Exodus is the book of Genesis, which we just finished studying. So we pretty much know uh, most of what we need to know in terms of what leads up to the book of Exodus, having just studied the book right before it. Uh, but if you happen to be joining us for the first time, you may want to know that the book of Exodus, like the book of Genesis, was also written by Moses. And Moses was identified in Deuteronomy 34 verse 10 as being a prophet. And I won't read the whole verse, but uh, since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. So that's not the main point of that verse. I'm just saying that in that verse, Moses is identified as a prophet. And so from time to time, I will refer to the prophet Moses. And that's what that is about. A prophet is someone who speaks forth on God's behalf. So a spokesman or a spokesperson for God. And uh, a spokesperson we, we would see in a modern day corporation, the uh, Madison Police Department has a spokesman. Moses was that spokesman on God's behalf. In terms of Moses being the author, we have a passing reference over in Exodus 17, 14, where God said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. 
Well, I'm, again, this is not the main point of this verse, but I'm saying that when God tells Moses to write something in a book, it's probably fairly safe to assume that Exodus is this book because Moses is the author. He's writing here about Amalek. And so Moses, therefore, is the author of the book of Exodus. Uh, not only that, but over in Mark chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, Jesus actually quotes from the book of Exodus. He doesn't say this is a quote from Exodus, but he quotes a passage that is found in Exodus. And Jesus identifies Exodus as having been written by Moses. You may remember back when Jesus was challenged by the Sadducees. They did not believe in the resurrection, and so they were trying to trick him up with one of these weird uh, scenarios. And Jesus responds by saying, But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. So we should just note here that not only does Jesus think that Moses wrote Exodus, but I also want us to note that he makes an entire argument about the resurrection by appealing to the grammar in the book of Exodus. God didn't say that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he said that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, indicating that they're still alive in some form. So I'm just saying even the grammar in the book of Exodus is inspired. As to the title of this book, the word Exodus refers to an exit or a departure, going back to a Latin word referring to going out. And that, by the way, is the same basis of the uh, name Exum. And so I share uh, that with the uh, book of Exodus here. So to go out with, I believe, is the literal translation of the word or the name Exum. And Exodus is very closely related to that, the idea of going out, which the Israelites are going to do. Concerning the timing of this book, we have an interesting reference over in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Well, basically, we find here that the Exodus takes place 480 years before the fourth year of King Solomon's reign, and that would have been around 966 B.C. So the closer we get to modern times, the more we can nail down those dates and we chain some things together. This is one of those little instances which puts the Exodus from Egypt right around 1445 or 1446 B.C., depending on what time of year that that was uh, taking place. So let's jump right into it tonight with Exodus chapter 1, and let's look at the first seven verses. Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were seventy in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Going back up to the beginning, notice we have 70 descendants of Jacob who came down to Egypt, but these were just the sons of Israel. So they also had servants and other members of the various households that were represented here, perhaps up to several thousand. We're not given the names. We're not told the exact number of everybody who came down with them. But the point here is that they started out as a relatively small number, especially compared to uh, a nation the size of Egypt. Uh, they were basically nothing. However, as time goes on, Joseph dies, and his brothers die, and everyone in that generation dies, and uh, the ones after that die, and so some time has passed you here. And as a group, uh, the family continues to grow, and so the children had children, and their children have children, and so on. And so as a group, the, the sons of Israel, they were fruitful, and they increased greatly, they multiplied, they became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them, according to the text. 
And I don't know whether you have a footnote on the increased greatly there in verse 7, but in the New American Standard, the translators indicate the word could also be translated as swarm. The people swarmed. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word swarm. In my mind, I think of bees or maybe a swarm of grasshoppers or locusts. They have this way of getting together and swarming, multiplying, and, and under the right conditions, they can certainly multiply so much that really it's amazing. And it gets to the point that they're too big for the space that they're in. They're pretty much forced to move out. And that's the picture that I get in verse number seven. Numbers-wise, the people are doing incredibly well, uh, even to the point where the land is filled with them. So they go from the 70 all the way up to filling the land, perhaps well over a million people, as we'll find later in the book of Numbers, where the military-aged men are numbered at more than 600,000. So if you have 600,000 men of military age, you would add all of the older and the younger men to that, then you'd add all the women, and that would come out to quite the figure, so maybe two to three million people. But as we might imagine, or as we already know, if we've read the book of Exodus, that starts making the Egyptians pretty nervous, doesn't it, when they grow to that extent. So let's take a look then at what happens next. This is Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Exodus 1, 8 through 14. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us, and fight against us, and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks, and at all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. Notice in verse 8, we have the first sign of trouble. And the first sign of trouble is that a new king arises over the land of Egypt. And unlike the previous kings or pharaohs, this one does not appreciate what Joseph had done many years beforehand. So this is a new guy, and the new guy is somewhat disconnected from history. And I would suggest politicians have a way of doing that, don't they? Promises are very short-lived. Our memory as a nation is very short-lived. A lot of things change and go back and forth between administrations. And that seems to be what we have here. So years have passed. People have this way of forgetting. Remember, you know, Joseph did so well in Egypt because he interpreted that other pharaoh's dreams, didn't he? And so trust was established, and Joseph was promoted. That was a personal relationship. Uh, Joseph had helped them out of the situation. Joseph and Pharaoh worked together for a number of years, getting ready for the famine, and then they worked together during the famine, ruling together. But now that the famine is this distant memory, Joseph and all of his children and his grandchildren have died off, and this new Pharaoh comes on the scene, and this new guy just doesn't get it. This new Pharaoh has other priorities. He has other things that he wants to get done. And all this Pharaoh can see is that he has this huge group of foreigners living on some of the best land in the entire nation of Egypt. And he has no sense of why this is the case. And since the Israelites are growing at a much faster rate than the native Egyptians, this Pharaoh is nervous. He's worried that they're about to be outnumbered, not just by the Israelites themselves, but he's worried the Israelites might team up with those who hate the Egyptians. But what we really need to notice is that Pharaoh isn't primarily concerned about being defeated in battle, if I understand this correctly. That's a concern, and it's big. But notice, he seems to be primarily concerned with the Israelites leaving. Did you notice that at the end of verse 10? At the end of verse 10, he's worried about these people leaving. So they had come to rely upon the Israelites as a part of their workforce. And he's imagining two to three million people getting mad and walking out for whatever reason. And that is not acceptable. So his plan at the beginning of verse 10, his suggestion to his people, is that they deal wisely with them, that they somehow keep them from multiplying, and that they somehow keep them from leaving. 
So notice in response, the wisest thing they could come up with was to appoint taskmasters over them and to afflict them with hard labor. And I don't know about you, but that reminds me a little bit of what King Rehoboam did after the death of his father, King Solomon, many years later. Remember the old wise advisors that had served his father faithfully suggested that he do what? They said, deal kindly with the people. Love them, they'll love you back. I'm just paraphrasing that. Well, that really wasn't what he was interested in doing, and so he checked with his peers. He checked with the younger men, and his peers suggested that he not treat them kindly, but instead that he raise the taxes and that he treat the people harshly, and that's the way that he did it. And, of course, we know what happened. The people rebelled. Uh, the kingdom split in two. Just an absolute disaster under Rehoboam. So Pharaoh then, I would suggest, also had some just terrible advisors. Notice at the end of verse 11, these taskmasters had the Israelites build the storage cities of Ramses and Pithom. However, in verse 12, the plan backfires, doesn't it? Instead of keeping the population down, these people multiply even faster. Of course, we kind of know how that happens biologically, but uh, these people seem to multiply in a way that is above and beyond what might be considered normal. That God was with them, and God was kind of aiding in this. I kind of think back to Jacob working for Laban. You remember how Jacob's flocks multiplied at a much faster rate than Laban's flocks? Why was that? It was because God was blessing a Jacob. And I think we seem to have something similar happening here. The more they labor, the more they multiply, the more they spread out. And now it's to the point that the Egyptians are absolutely terrified of these people. They are in dread of them. And so they compel them to work even more vigorously than before, making their lives bitter with hard labor, uh, making mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor out there in the fields. Well, since the hard labor alone isn't working, let's conclude tonight with Exodus 1, verses 15 through 22. And let's notice what Pharaoh does next. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra, and the other was named Pua. And he said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Well, since the hard work alone isn't doing the job here, notice Pharaoh now speaks to the Hebrew midwives. And we actually have their names, Pua and Shipra. As we've mentioned previously, when we've seen names like this in the text, sometimes names may be mentioned because these people have been known to the first readers. In other words, these two might have ended up as some well-known grandmothers in Israel at some point. Does that make sense? Imagine being a midwife and delivering hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of children in your career. You get to know people. You're there at their most intimate moment. You're there with families. I saw you being born, young man, and I didn't throw you in the Nile like I was told to, and, and so on. So I'm not saying that this is the case, but I'm saying it's at least possible that Moses puts the names in here because those who read the book for the first time might have recognized these two women. Oh, yeah, uh, Pua, she's the one who delivered me and my, you know, my 14 children or whatever. And so I'm just saying, these two women are, are most likely heroes in the history of God's people. But nevertheless, Pharaoh commands these two women that when they help the Hebrew women give birth, they are to kill the sons and they are to allow the little girls to live. So not only is the murder of children legal, as it is in most states here in the U.S. today, but the murder of children is actually commanded by the king. 
So this isn't a may kill, this is a must kill. The male children are to be killed as soon as they are born. That is the command of the king. However, I love verse 17 where we find that the Hebrew midwives feared God more than they feared the king of Egypt. And because of this, they let the boys live. Well, Pharaoh sees what's happening, that his plan doesn't seem to be working. And so he calls these women in and he questions them on it. And they explain, don't they? They explain that, well, you know, the, the Hebrew women, they're, they're more vigorous uh, than the Egyptian women. They, they give birth before we can even get there. You know, based on what we have in this passage, did the midwives lie? Just based on what we read in this passage, not necessarily. Remember, the, the Israelites, they're multiplying at a rate far beyond the Egyptians. And so we assume that those births must have been going pretty well. If you're a midwife and every baby lives and no women die in childbirth, and if the king has commanded you to kill every baby boy that you're there to deliver, would you be in a big hurry to get to every childbirth? Not really. Oh, the baby's on the way. Well, I'll be right there. I'll get there at some point. And then delay that a little bit. And they could have very easily been telling the truth here. But it was also true that the Israelite women were more vigorous than the Egyptians. We've already seen this with the multiplying of the Israelites earlier in this chapter. Just in terms of reproducing, everything is going well for these people. The whole nation is growing in a way that is virtually unprecedented. So the midwives, therefore, they fear God more than they fear this Egyptian king, Pharaoh. And I think some of us might be thinking of what Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, with reference to the disciples facing persecution for preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. You may remember to encourage his disciples to keep on keeping on. Jesus said to them, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so I would say maybe in some similar way that the Hebrew midwives feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And that was a really wise move on their part, wasn't it? Because of this decision, because they took a risk, because they feared God. Notice we find in verse 21 that God established households for them. Now we might think that the midwives are too busy out there delivering everybody else's children to have any children of their own, but that's not the case at all. Even the midwives are having babies. I may be speculating here just a bit, but in my mind, I see Pharaoh warning these women, you two need to start killing these babies, and the next time he sees them, they're both expecting children of their own. <laughs> it doesn't say that in the text, other than to say that God established households for them, Exactly how that happened, we're not told, but I'm just saying everything Pharaoh does seems to backfire. The more he issues commands, the faster these people multiply and the more God blesses the midwives. At the end of this chapter, then, Pharaoh gives this command not to the midwives anymore. He can't manipulate them. They're too, they're too stubborn to give in to this king. And so he gives the command to the whole nation. He can't bully these women into getting his way. So now he just gives this general command. Every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. By the way, where else do we see a king give the command to kill every baby boy? Don't we think of King Herod, who heard from the wise men that a king of the Jews had been born in Bethlehem, and so he ascertains the date based on when they saw the star? And as I understand it, he gives a command based on one year in each direction. Uh, concluding that every baby boy two years old and younger is to be murdered in the village of Bethlehem. Of course, that's why Jesus flees where? He goes to Egypt, doesn't he? Just some interesting connections between that situation over in the New Testament and what we have here. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 1. It's been an interesting book so far. In terms of the so what question, what is this chapter really mean for me personally? I might suggest that we take a lesson from the courage of the Hebrew midwives. That, that is 
it's been a highlight to me looking at this chapter again. Uh, these women really put themselves in danger here. And I say that, and it would have been risky on their part from their point of view, perhaps. But is it ever truly risky to obey God? Is it ever truly dangerous to obey God? Not at all. Um, it would have been much easier, though, for them to have obeyed the command of the king. But they knew that they answered to a much higher power. They answered to God. They knew it would be absolutely wrong to kill those baby boys. And as we think about what they did, I'm wondering whether they might have been inspired by Joseph, thinking back to their great-great-grandfather or whatever, you know, whoever he was to them. You know, it was difficult at times for Joseph to do what's right. Not necessarily difficult to do what's right, but it would have been easy for him to do wrong. Maybe that's another way of putting that. And I'm just wondering if they were inspired by Joseph turning away and running away from Potiphar's wife and, and so on. And this will be a theme throughout Scripture. God's people will often need to do what is dangerous or seemingly rebellious. And the reason is we answer to a higher authority. So I think in terms of a practical application of this passage, we have the courage of the midwives recorded here for us for a reason. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I know there are other things that we could have done on a night like this, but it's important that we take the time to study. And I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30. We're starting a brand new study of the one-chapter books of the Bible. There are five one-chapter books. Uh, many years ago, my dad, I remember him making the point that a chapter is technically a division. And so technically, we might refer to these as the five no chapter books in the Bible because there are no divisions in them. So they're known as the five one chapter books or no chapter books, maybe in our family. And so we have one of those in the Old Testament. Uh, Caleb will be covering that over the next three weeks. And then other men of the congregation will be taking turns for the rest of the one chapter or no chapter books throughout the rest of the summer. And, and those four are in the New Testament. Again, if you have any questions or concerns about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, if there's something that we need to be praying about, uh, please get in touch. And that contact information should still be on your screen. We updated that contact information since our study of Genesis. And if you're joining us on the phone, of course, you can't see that. And so I would just invite you to text me or give me a call at 608-224-0274. And we would love to hear from you. As we close this first chapter of Exodus, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, the God of Israel, you are a God who sees. You see everything. You see us at our best. You see us at our worst. And tonight we've seen that you take note, even when your people react to a test of faith, with great courage especially, you took note of that. Thank you, Father, for telling us about the faith of Shipra and Pua. We're thankful for their courage and standing up against the king's command and doing what was right. We pray, Father, that we would have that same courage when the world around us tries to pry us away from doing what is right, from what is revealed to us in your word, that we would be strong. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for saving us from our sins. We come to you in his name. Amen.